One of the most iconic buildings in downtown Montreal, Mille de la Gauchetière, looking amazing in all of that construction down at the bottom there. Oh yes, René Levesque Street. Never going to get any better. <laughs> the Jeremy White Podcast, of course, brought to you by tasty, tasty, delicious, garlicky, garlicky Bustan. The best Lebanese cuisine in all of Montreal. Over 24 locations around the 514. Just visit Bustan.ca. I got to recommend the chicken trio, garlic, coleslaw. Throw some potatoes on the pita, too. Just ask them. They'll do it. It's the best. Bustan.ca. All right, let's get to our first guest. I'm very excited to have this guy on the show. He's a Grammy Award-winning, legendary rock and roll guitar player, one of the biggest names to come out of the 80s, and he's still on top of his game. The one, the only, as Rock Talk with Mitchell Fawn host would say, the one, the only, Steve Stevens. Right on, What's man. What's going on? Good to see you. <laughs> uh, Mitchell, Mitchell Fawn is like my, uh, my mentor. He's like one of my best friends. Yeah. So I told him, I was like, he's like, you need to come up with a slogan. Because at the beginning of his podcast, he always says, right. uh, bienvenue, as we say in Montreal, bonjour, comment ça va? Okay. Right, yeah. Is so, that where you are? That, yeah, I'm in Montreal. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, but I'm actually from a native reservation. So I'm I'm a Mohawk from Gunawage, which I, I'm going to talk to you about that. So I was thinking okay. about going with like a Mohawk saying like, what's going to work out? Say go. go. <laughs> That'll work. I don't think anybody will be able to repeat it back to me, though. So That's all right. That's good. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah, because I'm from Montreal. So our reservation is like 15 minutes from downtown Montreal. Like we're right on. So the town is called Gahnawage. And okay. in English, it translates to by the rapids. So we're right on the St. Lawrence Rapids. Okay. Gotcha. And a lot of our family actually is uh, we have like a bit of a Brooklyn connection because my great grandmother, she moved to Brooklyn when she was 16. And my okay. grandmother was born and raised in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Do you know what part? Yeah, she uh, stayed in Bond. Where is that? It's uh, it's just off Atlantic, like not too far, 365 okay. right. State yeah. Street. Okay. Yeah. My grandfather, my great grandfather was, uh, was a vet. He met, she met him at uh, Atlantic Bar and Atlantic Avenue and uh, served wow. the family down there. And Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you were growing up, did you, did you know any, uh, any Indians? Did you hang out with any Mohawks over there? Or, cause, uh, the, Not the, in the, New York. No. The only thing I knew was that Broadway was originally an Indian trail. Yeah. You learned that in grade school. Yeah, we gave it, it away for it like two matchsticks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it must be beautiful where you are. Yeah, well, we're like one of the more fortunate towns. Like if you go up to, mm -hmm. you know, in northern Canada where the other reservations are, man, it's just terrible. Like third world country level uh -huh. kind of crap. It, it, Dude, it's bad. Like no running mm -hmm. water. There's no electricity. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. Like the alcohol. That's where like when you hear about like drunken Indian and stuff like uh, in northern yeah. Canada, like there's it's it's terrible living conditions. And, uh, you know, like a case of bottled water up north is like three hundred dollars for a pack of 24 or something like they mark up the prices uh -huh. and. And the thing wow. is that they have no money to buy this shit. So it's like, right? It's it's just it's crazy. So if you ever, wow. if you're ever actually, interested. I have a a um, a chiropractor healer who's from. He actually flies. This dude is so special. He's from Quebec. He lives there. Okay. And he flies in uh, to Los Angeles once a month to to uh, see his clients and stuff. Oh, so uh, that's cool. Natural that's healers. Cool. You can't you can't beat that. Yeah. Well, he does chiropractic and a little bit of energy work and all, you know, okay. us guitar players, we have bad backs. Yeah. <laughs> like just, I'm surprised you're not hunched over at this point. Oh man. Yeah. We all have, we all complain when we meet new guitar players, we go, Hey, great. I'm a real fan. How's your back? <laughs> <laughs> you're popping the Aleve and getting a rub of Voltaren before you go on stage. And oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's common. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about your guitar playing. Um, you know, just again, I've, I've been listening to a lot of the the first two Billy Idol albums lately. And uh, like, because you and I, we met last year on the Brian Adams tour, just super briefly backstage. Right. And that's kind of like where we like connected. And so I, I started listening to those two first albums a lot. And I want to talk about those just specifically about your guitar playing. You know, on, on the, um, you know, you go from Billy who has his roots in a lot of punk rock. Right. And then, you know, you were kind of more... Like, didn't you get only get your first electric like electric guitar when you were thirteen? You were playing acoustic. I did I, yeah. I my dad brought a guitar home for himself <clears throat> when I was I wasn't even seven years old yet. Mm. Um, but he didn't have the time to put into it. You know, he was a blue collar <laughs> worker. Got home, barely had time. You know, he's barely had enough energy to eat dinner, and you know, so the guitar ended up in my bedroom, and um, <clears throat> and this was the time of uh, you know folk 
defunct uh, scene was really popular. James Taylor, right. Johnny Mitchell, all of this. And in my neighborhood, although I was born in Brooklyn, I was raised in Queens and Rockaway. Uh, there, there's my Indian uh, connection. Rockaway is in yeah. Indian. Um, so uh, there was a very famous protest singer from Rockaway named Phil Oaks. <clears throat> and um, okay. his sister was my first guitar teacher. So I spent all those years uh, playing um, you know, a lot of uh, you know, folk, folk and a little bit of country right. guitar. And in 13, I got an electric guitar. So do you think that when you came, when it came to recording those albums, you know, not having necessarily just that straight up, you know, three chords and the truth kind of background, you know, you were playing real kind of, if you're going to play classical and folky, you know, you're doing a lot of finger stuff and you're doing a lot of kind of expanded chords and it's almost like orchestrating different parts, but within the same kind of finger arrangement, you know what I mean? So when you went to record those albums, because I listened to that second Billy Idol album And there's so much going on in the guitar realm that I don't think anybody really talks to you about because, you know, at the time you had Pyromania that came out in January. Right. And then you had Billy Idol, Rebel Yell that came out, what, November, I think, of 83? That's right. Yeah, Yeah. November. So at the time, in my mind, the only people Mm. that were doing really cool orchestrated guitar parts like that was Def Leppard and you. Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, you know, we started recording that record in uh, late 83 and, um, <clears throat> the, you know, keyboards were all the rage. It was new wave and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And I was, I was not going to let keyboards on the record. <laughs> so I had to be inventive with my guitar stuff. And I made a deal with our producer, Keith Forsey. I said, let me try and do on the guitar what we would imagine a keyboard doing. And if it sucks, you know, no, no harm done. Then you bring in the keyboards. <laughs> Just wipe the and, tape and we'll do it again. Yeah. And, um, and fortunately it gave the record a, a kind of a unique edge uh, because a lot of the guitar stuff was, you know, more than just a heavy rock thing or whatever. And, you know, it was really the, 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 sum of the parts, Billy obviously coming from the punk rock thing in, in, in London started at the same time as the Sex Pistols with Generation X. Yeah. Our producer, Keith, was <clears throat> had worked with Giorgio Moroder and did those Donna Summers records. So he's like a dance disco guy. So you and got influences was, from all over the place. Exactly. And we all brought our specialties, I think. And, uh, you know, not only did I have the folk thing, but, I, you know, I was learning electric guitar at the height of the English rock guitar guys like Brian May and, you know, Zeppelin was going and the who and, yeah. uh, and all this stuff. So I had all this kind of, you know, it was great, a great time to pick up the guitar. Yeah. I mean, especially, you don't. Know, so you grew up listening to those kind of bands. Like you grew up listening to Zeppelin and, and the yeah. queen. So those were your influences. Right. Anything out of England. There was yeah. a, um, <clears throat> WNEW in New York had a show every Friday called things from England. And it's funny, it had such an impact on me because I'd listen, it was a two hour show, I'd listen and then go to the department store and buy these English imports. <laughs> and I've recently heard Paul Stanley talk about exactly that. He was listening to that same show and getting all the English imports and stuff. So uh, yeah. really influential on on us New York kids at that time. Was, it, was the Raspberries an English band or were they American? American. Yeah, they were yeah, American. But so, so inspired by... By the UK. Uh, you know, a lot of Beatles and, you know, kind of uh, uh, zombies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I want Talking about your guitar work on those albums, you know, you were one of the first to kind of have a really, really processed guitar sound in the sense mm-hmm. like, you know, you, you listen to... Everybody talks about Eddie Van Halen and his use of delays on, like, Cathedral and stuff. and But you listen to some of those clean tones that you're doing with, like, the nice chorus and, like, lo- there's a lot of delay going on in there. Where did you get the idea for all those guitar tones that you were using? Um, I mean, it was, you know, Rebel Yell was done in, in Electric Lady, Hendrix Studio. Yeah. And back then, you know, the, this was a days of big budget album, so we had Lockout. So... I was so inspired, man. I mean, you know, I grew up in New York and as a kid, I used to go to the movie theater next to Electric Lady, you know, to see uh, Kids Are All Right or a rock film or whatever. (laughs) They had the all night rock. And here I am, I'm in the damn studio and I never left the place. And I just like me and the engineer, just like we had a field day and a lot of the effects and things that were coming out then were all new. And um, it was an exciting time for, for, for gear. 
So what was the main what was what, what was the main uh, amp that you used on that on that album? Because it almost sounds like are you using like a Rockman on there or a couple of tracks of Rockman. Um, yeah. Not not that I, you know. What happened was we actually recorded a lot of the tracks before we had a real drummer. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because it's a lot of Lindrum drum. on that album, right? Right. So we were looking for a drummer. So some of the guitar tracks, Blue Highway, uh, was done with a rock man. I always said I wanted to replace it, but... Oh, it know, sounds great. Why would you do that? I mean, I guess, it, you know, it is of the time, you know. It, it You know, yeah. now I look at it and go, yeah, I guess it's okay. But at the time... But, but the main guitar amp was one that I... Uh, I had since be, the band I was in before Billy Idol, mm. I used to build pedal boards for guys. And one of the guys gave me this vintage amp and uh, actually had Jim Marshall's signature on the inside of the cabinet. Ooh. So it was a, yeah, it was a, a early 70s. I got lucky. I didn't, you know, got this amp and uh, I still have it, still record with it. Nice. And it's a little good luck charm. Yeah. I mean, that it doesn't get more legit than that. You got the man's signature inside it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. So you, you did a, you use a Rockman on a couple of those tracks, but you know, I'm, listen to the guitar arrangements on the album though, because there's a lot going on and it's you. And as soon as I hear it, like I, I hear you, like that is how you sound and that's your tone. But, and you said that you wanted to replace the Rockman sound, but what's in my mind, you know, a lot of people talk about modern sounding records. And I mm-hmm. think every rock band that puts out an album now, it all sounds the same. They're all using the same drum plugins they're all using the same virtual amps. Everything sounds the same. So when you hear a classic album like that and that classic guitar tone, I think it's awesome that it has a distinctive, recognizable sound right away. Yeah, I mean that's this was the days of guitar players had to find a unique voice and yeah. all of those. You know, and I, hopefully I'm one of those guys who like, you know, you strive to to have to be able to play three notes and people go, I know who that. I mean. Whether you think Neil Young is brilliant or crap, you hear three <laughs> notes of him. I think he's brilliant, but you hear three notes and you go, "That's Neil Young," right. and um, and that's that's uh, you know, and and, and uh, same with Kurt Cobain. You know, not terribly tech tech technique savvy, but you know it's him. And I think that's the most important thing. Uh, it goes for singers as well. Sometimes you know, singer may not have the greatest range or greatest pitch, but I mean, Dylan is the perfect example. Or Hendrix, they're not trained singers, but you know it's them and it's yeah. the emotion behind it. As soon as you hear, uh, please, you know, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's Jimmy, you know? Yeah, That's exactly. Jimmy. He was very shy about his singing. You know, he did not, he was not a fan of, of his own voice, but right. could you imagine anybody else singing that? No. No, not at all. And then it's, yeah. you know, it's it would be weird to hear somebody else actually singing it. Yeah. That should be one band that should never be covered ever. Hendrix. <laughs> it's a hard one to do. Yeah. 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 Although Stevie Ray Vaughan did, did, did justice. Oh, Stevie, man. Man, the yeah. guitar player on that guy. It was interesting that you'd bring up Stevie Ray Vaughan. You know, in the 80s, was he considered a good guitar player? Oh, yeah. 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 It's funny. Or was because- it like, or was it just like in like the guitar circles? Everybody's like, oh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. But like in the general mass public like population, was he a guitar hero? Yeah, I mean, that record, when he, <clears throat> the first thing we heard from him was obviously David Bowie. And um, they were recording, New York was, a, at that time in the early 80s, was a real close-knit thing of everybody knew, you know, it's all these studios happening and everybody yeah. knew what was going on. And we heard word that Bowie's got a hot guitar player, you know, working <laughs> with him. Like, oh, who is this guy? Nobody really knew who he was. And then, um, uh, I guess Let's Dance was the, the first, uh, yeah, first so. single off that. Yeah. I went, oh, that's the guy, <laughs> you know, right. you just hear but that. Yeah, clean I tone. Mean, you know, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty obvious, uh, yeah. from the get go that he was somebody to be reckoned with. And then, you know, you hear stuff like Pride and Joy and that rhythm. Oh my just, God. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. We have a guitar player here in my town. His name's Donnie Breezebois, and the dude uh, plays exactly like Stevie. It's insane. Yeah. 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 And it's all in that rhythm. It's all in the handwork. And, you know, like be able to go from the chord and then like into the solo and then go back. It, it's such a technique. It's, yeah. And it's an undefinable thing between the lines are blurred with guys like that between rhythm and lead, like Hendrix. Yeah. They, they just meld it all together. And it's, uh, it's great when they can do that. There's no. not many guys who can pull that off. 
Yeah, exactly. You don't hear him using a super processed tone with tons of delay, though. No. <laughs> oh, man, that's crazy. I, I just love stuff like that because it's inter it's interesting to see, like, just the differences between, you know, certain genres and certain players at the same time and see what they were considered to be, you know, a guitar god or not. Right. Whereas, you know, right. we look back now and it's like, holy shit, that was some really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... um. <clears throat> It was, you know, making making records at that point, it was, uh, I think maybe because I was in New York, <clears throat> I was away from the kind of L.A., you know, I loved Van Halen, I was aware yeah. of Eddie and all that stuff, but I was away from all the other guys who kind of were in the wake of, you know, everybody wanted to sound like Van Halen right. if, they, if they were from L.A. or what. But in New York, uh, it wasn't as big a thing. Uh, and, uh, and we still had the kind of street, you know, we still loved Kiss and New York Dolls. Yeah. And all well, of New, our York New York is a very, yeah. you know, punk town, you know, everything from the right. dictators to, uh, exactly. you know, dancing in the exactly. misfits. Yeah. I mean, the thing that bonded Billy and I, because when we first met, you know, here's this punk rock guy and here's me kind of influenced by a lot of the bands that punk was not, a, you know, was kind of like breaking down. Yeah. But we bonded over, over Lou Reed because I... I knew all those Lou Reed songs and stuff. So nice. that was kind of, Oh, okay. I see some common ground here. Yeah. Have you, have you talked to Billy lately? I know his mom just passed away. My condolences to the whole crew. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. She passed away last week. Um, but he's, he's now a grandfather. And I think that's kind of, he's spending a lot of time with his uh, granddaughter and uh, I think it's good therapy for him. Yeah. Keeps you, keeps you together. I just lost my uncle like two weeks ago to cancer and it's just like, it's such a uh, weird I'm year, sorry. man. It's like, uh, yeah, all kinds of crap. It, you know, here in the States, you can't even really travel to, you know, no? um, to, to go, you know, to go see people because of the, the COVID thing. Well, that's it. You know, it's like, and how do you even go to a funeral? It's like, it's just, it's, yeah. it's just a weird situation. So yeah. where are you? Yeah. Are you in uh you, you're on the West coast. I'm in LA. Yeah. In I've LA. lived here for about 26 years. Nice. Where, where's Billy live? Is he still, is he in the UK? In LA. Yeah. In LA yeah. too. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys see each other often? Like, are you guys working on some new music? We are, we are. We've been in this. I mean, we finished in Vegas. We do our Vegas run and we finished in March. I think we were actually the last live um, live band that ran. Um, we yeah. stopped doing the meet and greets when, you know, and uh, we finished our last two shows and then we both uh, went into uh, isolation and, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then we, you know, about a month after that, um, we, you know, we got tested and said, all right, let's write some music. Nice. So we've been, been writing and still product. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's what we do. And oh, I guess I that's mean, all you can heart, do, you know, you're musicians yeah, I mean, at the end of the day. <laughs> I mean, not to be honest with you, not that much has changed for me other than not being able to go out and play. But I have a home studio. I'm in here anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you got your whole I'm guitar rig there. You you got you're sorted. That's that's exactly it. So so it's. Uh, I mean, my wife pulling her hair out because she's she's an outdoors <laughs> person, but I'm a, I'm a studio rat. You know, it's it's like okay, I'll just work. You're like yeah, if I don't have to go out, I'm staying behind the console. I'm good. Yeah, I mean, or you know, I, I always you know either either practicing, playing guitar or writing or, yeah. you know, something in here. What are you using in your home studio? Like, uh, I guess you're running Pro Tools, obviously. Were you like one of the first guys to have a home studio and kind of uh, embrace the Pro Tools thing or? No, but what I, that was a deciding factor in me moving to LA from New York. Um, I met Duff McKagan and he had a home studio, a really beautiful home studio you can't have that in New York. And I went, oh, no. I see what I could do here. It's impossible so to have anything life. in New York. You can't even, you're living on top of four other people if you want to tr eat. Man, you, you'd pay more for parking to keep a parking <laughs> spot than you would for a house. So, yeah. um, so I moved out here and put together a home studio and it's, um, you know, I still I have an analog board here. I'm still old school. I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not doing EDM here. So it's, no. It's, uh, you know, it's guitar based. It's, it's, you know, I have everything at my disposal that I would need. And, um, nice. and it, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a, a little playpen really. Yeah, totally. So is that, that guitar rig that's behind you, is that the one that you'd bring on the road with you or is that just exclusively no, for the studio? No, studio stuff. Yeah. The, uh, Mike Prees and all that stuff. My actually just on the last run in Vegas, I had like 
stuff is getting smaller now, you know, because <laughs> as you're traveling, you know, your road yep. manager is going, you know, how much this stuff weighs to bring it to Europe and put it on a boat. And, yeah. and so I had just gotten a new guitar rig. I was really happy with that was much smaller. And uh, I was really looking forward to it. <laughs> I, got, I got two gigs out of it. <laughs> <laughs> two gigs. That's it. Damn yeah. it. It's not worth it. Not worth the money. Yeah, we did two gigs and it was great. I was like, yeah. Okay. Was well, it just like a little lunch, like one of the one of the fractal things, or? Uh, um, no, I'm still using. I have a, a signature amp out with Friedman. I'm oh, still okay. using regular, regular tube amps, uh, speaker cabinets. Um, but I used, you know, I was one of those '80s guys that had that huge refrigerator rack full of yeah. effects and stuff, and um, and you needed it. I mean, you know, in order to replicate some of those records back then, mm-hmm. you needed all that gear. But now yeah. you can do it in a little, a much smaller, uh, uh, you know, there's one box that'll do everything now. Yeah. A lot of it is just one rack mount thing or, uh, you mm-hmm. know, a, a multi effects, uh, pedal board and you're golden. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, I saw on your Instagram that you're doing a bunch of, uh, signature guitar patches too. Uh, signature what are you, you're doing, are you doing like guitar patches? Like, uh, selling your, uh, like, are you designing tones and then selling them too? Oh no, I haven't done that yet. No, no, I haven't. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about it, but we haven't done that. What, what happened was, you know, when Rebel Yell, I'm, I'm, I'm well known for the ray gun effect. Yeah, yeah, right. Of course. So, <clears throat> so those things, the ones that I use, I doctor them and I open them up and, and put little uh, rate controls in them, and, and they were getting harder and harder to find, <laughs> and I'd be breaking them on the road. Actually, a girl in jumped up on the stage after our London gig and stole one. We, oh. <laughs> we had to track her down through the promoter and find it. Oh shit. <laughs> so um, it's a hot item. I, it's, hot, it's hotter than the merch booth. It's like, I, you know, I tell my guitar tech guard that with your life, but I came across about 25 uh, of these units from the, from the seventies. Like the original, and, uh, original thing. The, the ones that I doctor like on stage. Wow. So I made them available to fans who want to buy them. So we sold out in like a day. Oh man! Um, so you're so doctoring. Like, so what are you doing to like to modify it? Like uh, the secret, man. I can't, I'd have to tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> well, if you told me, I know, wouldn't I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> talking, you know, talking about that ray gun sound. Like I said, I was just recently listening to all those albums again. That ray gun sound on the album, it's a very fat sound to it. It doesn't just sound like the little speaker coming out of out of the ray gun. Like it's got like, it's got like a bottom end to it as well. How did, how yeah. did you get that sound? Well, back then we had a, there was a company called Lexicon that had a really good digital delay. Every guitar player used them. Everyone needed a Lexicon. The still uses them. And um, they still sound really good. So we'd use the ray gun, you know, I had this toy ray gun. That's kind of how I stumbled across it. And then I'd step on the pedal at the same time and it would make this oscillating sound. I blew speakers doing it, but, <laughs> but it, it, the end result was kind of worth it, you know. Hey, if you didn't blow one speaker when you're recording something revolutionary, I one, mean. Try four. <laughs> <laughs> four even. Jeez. Uh, how do you think that sound would have went over in 2020? Had you done that on a new single, let's say Rebel Yell came out today. Right. What do you think the world would have thought of it? And how do you think it would have been I mean, received? So, who knows? I mean, it's so different now. The, you know, and also we had that. The, but at the end of the day, isn't a good song a good song? Yeah, but we had a, we had a platform for it right. with, with MTV. And that video, that live video of, of Rebel Yell really permeated the masses and when we went out on tour, the audiences wanted to replicate what the audience was doing in the video. So yeah. it's, it telegraphed something about how, you know, because we when we started that tour, we were still playing clubs and eventually went to arenas. And uh, that was the record that broke the, uh, Billy Idol. But those, those videos were really in everybody's, uh, you know, uh, home. Yeah, in everybody's house. Yeah. And- I mean, at the end of the day, I guess MTV and radio is really the platform for you to yeah, become famous. But, but I'm proud. I'm proud to say, you know, even if I'm driving and I hear Rebel Yell come on, um, it still sounds good. You know, it's. Well, I it's, don't think it. I personally don't think it sounds dated at all. I mean, like, you know, you mentioned that the guitar tone might be a little dated in a sense. But, you know, I was listening to our local rock station uh, right. and they were playing a new song from this uh, this new band. 
But then they played another one from a new band, and then another uh-huh. one from a new band. And everybody is going back to this organic kind of 70s-ish homage kind of production. But right. if you listen to the pop radio, everybody's doing the 80s thing. You listen to The Weeknd. You listen to Dua Lipa. Everybody's going back a- a- to it. Absolutely, yeah. So why do you th- what do you think it is about the about the rock scene that everybody's sort of afraid to go back to those processed drums and big guitars and you know cannonball snares like what what's the stigma around the music that people are well it, you know uh, Billy Idol has always had one foot in rock and one foot in pop yeah and well you, you listen know, to those, those attitude you listen to those I first mean, two, would, yeah yeah we were definitely trying to 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 create singles and and. And uh, memorable tunes, a lot of the tunes were, you know, why should we put a guitar solo on it? Is there a reason for it? And if there is going to be a guitar solo, uh, it, it, it better reflect the message of the song rather than just for the sake of putting a guitar solo on it. Right. No, that makes total sense. And that's kind of like the Mutt Lang approach at the same time as well. Right. Yeah. You know? And it's interesting that you would say Mutt because both Mutt and Keith Forsey, Keith being a drummer, the attention to detail and sometimes drove me crazy because you had to lock into the groove. And us like Def Leppard, we we were, were uh, recording uh, to a grid, to a click. Right. And uh, a lot of rock records back then weren't. No. So, so we were able to do edits and extended dance remixes like Def Leppard did. Uh, whereas a lot of the rock bands from there, they, they, they didn't, think about any of that sort no, of stuff. Not at all. And it's, I, I mentioned that because, you know, you listen to Rebel Yell and then you listen to Pyromania and it's, it's kind of yeah. got the same kind of, you know, production aspect to it as at the same yeah, time. Yeah. The attention to detail and groove. It's got so the much under, groove. Yeah. The underneath groove is, is, you, you, you know, that was always the thing, get the motor and the cement and the, the foundation solid and then you can build on it. Yeah. You know, so, no slop. When you were doing that album, you know, you, a lot of it was the Lindrum. So would you have a drum pattern and then you'd play to that? Or did you have a riff or, you know, you listen to something like uh, like Daytime Drama or something, you know? did, uh, did Well, on Rebel Yell, Keith Forsey did all the Lindrum programming. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, uh, and he, he was brilliant at it. He was an early adoptee of it. And uh, so we kind of knew which songs needed the real drums, Rebel Yell, mm-hmm. real real drums, Blue Highway, real drums. Um, but things like Flesh for Fantasy, you know, obviously needed a, 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 a perfect drum, yeah. dance drum yeah. thing to it. Needed that sequencing so the to it. Needed it. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. I like it. You know, I like stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I've always liked, like, you know, there's no rules, man. There's no, you know, you try stuff and, and see if it works. And, and half of the, you know, what I always tell guitar players, you know, budding guitar players are you know, doing these uh, online classes for rock and roll fantasy camp. Now. Right. And I tell people, it's not really what you know, it's the mistakes that you make so that you don't do yeah. that again. No, totally. That's how you get knowledge. It's, you have to screw up to, you know, <laughs> to do. And we screwed up a lot, man. <laughs> hey, it's trial and error at the end of the day. You, you can't innovate without making some mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are what make things you stumble upon, you, we always said the beautiful mistake, you stumble upon something and you go, that's that's the hook. And you go, what? And they go, roll the tape back, what? what? Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. Do that again. And they're that's like, the oh, it wasn't recorded, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> right, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, I appreciate uh, taking some time to chat with you. I don't want to take up uh, your whole day, but. Uh, it's my pleasure, Ab- absolutely. I think we both share a love of, of both, you know, modern pop records and, and, and yeah. rock and, you know, uh, I was looking. What is your wife your, into? Like, what does she listen to on If she, you know, she's hanging out around the house or whatever, you know, she's giddy. She doesn't want to do with herself. And, you know, she's got some music on in the background. Like what's she, well, she grew to? up as a, as a metal kid. She used to go to like see Deicide and, you know, <laughs> oh, okay. and all this, but now she lo- she's all about, uh, she likes the, 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 the Beyonce and, um, and, uh, you know, she likes modern records, which is great for me because she'll play me something or I'll hear it. Yeah. And I go, oh, that's cool. That's, you know, that's a good hook or something. Because, you know, good song, like you said, good songs, a good song. Yeah. And 
you have to have something that's that that's memorable and and I think a lot of there's a lot of cool sounds on modern pop records. Yeah, and, there um, is. And I'm, 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 you know, if I can if I can adopt some of those things, because the listeners are used to this huge bandwidth because of, you know, uh, pop records have tons of bottom end and you know they're great production on those records is great i mean it's it's next so, level uh, if you listen to the new album from the weekend or, or dua lipa you know dua lipa just, and like i was saying like everything old is new again in the sense that you listen to the pop side and you know the weekend and his album it's super 80s and then you listen to dua lipa you know a lot she, of that influence. yeah she yeah. just sampled uh in excess uh need you tonight that bow 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 like that oh, whole part, uh, and she uh, she took that and used it as the the hook of the, her song. It's a number one on pop radio. Uh, yeah, I'll have to listen for that because yeah. that's an awesome hook. It's called it's called "Break My Heart" by Dua Lipa, and it's fantastic. Okay. Check it out. Yeah. So are you are you going to be taking some uh, influences from uh, the uh, modern modern pop stuff and throwing it on a Billy Idol well, song? It's it's sonically, yeah. The some of the stuff we're working on is is uh, is sonically. Um, uh, I can't say who we're working with as a producer right now, but he's definitely somebody who's making those records. You're that, not working that, with Max Martin, are you? No, 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 no. He's a rock and roll guy, but he's a he makes modern records, and oh. and the combination is great. I wish I could say, but but I'll, 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 I got to keep it in the in the can right I'm trying now. Trying to think but, who it is. Uh, is it Watt? Uh, Andrew yeah. Watt? What's that? Is it Andrew Watt? No, it's not. No, no. <laughs> I'm just Although we from- would. I'm going to keep throwing names out there. Oh, Watt is amazing. What he did with Ozzy? Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. What did you think exactly. of that Ozzy album? Did you, did you listen to it? I, I mean, Sonically is great. And the, yeah. and the, um, and the um, uh, you know, the, the it's, I mean, come on. Anytime you get to hear a new Ozzy record is, is awesome. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm a huge fan of, of, uh, of, of Zach and all that, you know, and, and love that. But, um, it's not that kind of record, but it is it is a really good record. And, yeah. and uh, you know, some of the ballad stuff on there is awesome. And yeah, it's great. I like the I like that record because it's a big production. I'm a big I'm a fan of big production. Like right. I said, you know, I was listening to this this new band and their sound. It sounds like a record from 1974. And I'm like, OK, that was cool in 1974, but it's 2020. Right. Why are you making it sound like crap? You know, <laughs> you know, make it sound big. You know, yeah, instead of these yeah. uh, four mics on the drums, you know, uh, do something good with it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. All right, man. Well, uh, I know you're available on Cameo and stuff, so uh, people can uh, book you on Cameo, get your birthday messages Absolutely. and all that. And I also like yeah. the fact that your prices aren't like super cheap. You're not taking advantage of your fans. No, no. And a lot of a lot of people are asking. I'm getting a lot of guitar players who have a question about a song. Now, I'm not doing lessons on there, no. but I will show you a, a, a bit. And if they're specific and say, how do you do the second part of that? I have no problem yeah. showing, you know, if I can pass on a little knowledge. So, Like, uh, hey, Steve, can you show me the jangle part in uh, daytime drama? Or, oh, know? yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting all of that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fine, man. It's all good. You know, cool. if I believe me. If I could have done that and asked Jimmy Page, you know, uh, in the rain song, the third chord, what the hell is it? <laughs> Imagine. I would have been all about that. <laughs> yeah, I would have been all about it. That's nuts. All right, yeah. Steve. Well, thanks a lot for taking some time to chat. Uh, so new music from Billy Idol in 2021. Can we expect it? Um, I, maybe even sooner. Soon? Ooh, like late 2020? Possibly. Like put it in my uh, my stocking or? Um, yeah, right. That's, that's you know, maybe, maybe, man. Right. We're, we're, we're buzzing along. Good. I'm excited about that. That's cool. Great. All right. Well, thanks a lot for chatting, and uh, we'll catch up, man. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. See you later. Bye-bye.